Yes. Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my illustrious co-host, Matt Scott. Hello, I'm here. And you have had uh, birthdays, and you have had travels, and you have had uh, rear engine car adventures. Yeah. Tell me about this uh, this little drive you did on some great roads in California. Well, I also got engaged, which was cool. That is really cool. So um, Congratulations. That, that was really fun. Yeah, I engaged to Laura. We've been together for uh, a, a period of time that required engagement. <laughs> Um, too busy. You are, you are too lucky. Too busy. She said yes. Too busy traveling. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we were, I had no yeah. excuse during COVID. Yeah, no. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Did a, did, did a trip with, uh, another kind of fellow automotive journalist, Brian Dorr. He just bought a 911 turbo 996. Um, we'd been saving up for that for a while and a friend Yusuf in a GTR and when did all the driving roads did Pecla, which is the Porsche experience center LA, which was awesome. Like they have this, this polished uh, epoxied concrete skid pad that has this um, hydraulic kick plate and you drive down this you know this thing between 15 and 30 mile an hour you don't know which way it's going to kick the car and the faster you go the faster it simulates like total loss of control sure so it's kind of that was really fun and then yeah it was it was a really good trip hung out with Bass and Wasif who's another auto journo he took us on the Angeles he's a, Crest. He's a great guy. Yeah, he's 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 that dude can drive. I mean, nine eleven Carrera S, like fast car, um, and he was in a some, I don't know, like an Acura. Like I, I don't I don't know anything about Acuras. Sorry to Acura enthusiasts, <laughs> but like he was in an Acura. Yeah, four door. Yeah, smoked me. <laughs> um, smoked all of us. Like. It helps that he's probably driven that road 700 times. Yeah, that help, it helps to know the curves for sure. Yeah, yeah. But no, that was great. Um, well, and another kind of adventure. I mean, we, we can oftentimes get so focused on the fact that we need to be on these remote dirt roads. But some of the most enjoyable moments that I've had in my travels have yeah. been on paved roads with incredible views. and Glendora Mountain Road is the best road that I've driven, and it's like minutes from hell. Right. Uh, yeah like but there's no one there it's like uh, obscure to me because in arizona we I, i've come to the realization we just don't have that many roads um not like that yeah not like that you know so like there's a lot more people there but there's also disproportionately more roads for those people we're yeah. like in prescott we have highway 89 which is fun to drive but also is there for an actual purpose yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so. glendora mountain road is like goes nowhere i don't know where it, it like, literally goes nowhere like you don't yeah. really have a reason to be there yeah not if you want to get there in a hurry. So yeah. yeah, but that's awesome that those roads exist. Yeah, it was really it was really cool. You know, it's it's been interesting not being able to travel um, in the same capacity. I mean, you know, for me, overlanding is more about international travel um, than it is domestic stuff. I mean, I don't. That's just my my personal thing. Um, I like the culture and stuff. So I've kind of taken this time. You know, all that money that isn't going into experiences and stuff. Um, just been kind of playing around with cars and yeah. working like 80 hours a week. Yep. So, you know, it was nice to, it was nice to actually kind of like shut off and get away for a little oh, bit. Oh, totally. And with just great people and yeah, and there's good restaurants and yeah, it's another form of travel adventure is certain. And if you think about some of those rallies that go from London to Singapore and a lot of times they're driving these vintage sports cars. Yeah. And like, yeah. Peking to Paris. Yeah. Would be so cool. Um, yeah. It's just, it's open to this new, concept to me of um of taking the spirit of overlanding and the the idea of lesser explored roads you know dirt roads turn into lesser explored roads mm -hmm. technical trails turn into uh technical paved roads that are yeah. that are well known um and applying the same kind of curiosity i mm -hmm. guess um that you would in a in a four-wheel drive so yeah and the the vehicle continues to be this magic carpet that transports us to yeah. wherever we're going and those magic carpets that you've been driving are just much faster <laughs> they're just they're just a lot maybe not as fast as a trx but <laughs> but that that one's a little bit of a freak of nature so uh, how uh, fun though right um, that's awesome yeah yeah it was fun but yeah so guys we're going to talk about expedition vehicles today specifically like the integrated stuff so we're not talking about home builds we're not talking about add-on campers and that kind of stuff that'll be a different podcast we're talking about earth cruisers um we're talking about earth roamers we're talking about action mobiles we're talking about all the big stuff that 
makes your mouth water that you want so much. Yeah. And um, that you want, you can live out of and you, can live and, out you of. and you buy it as a complete camper. And there, there have always been some options, but now there's more options than ever. Yeah. And it feels like that almost on a weekly basis, some new model has come, mm-hmm. you know, available. Like I think it would be good to talk about some of the ones that have recently been announced, but total composite integrated campers. Now they're starting to do more and more volume and they have a great reputation for quality and value. So if you're looking for yeah. a camper, that's high quality and great, great people there. Yeah. Great people, good value as well. And a lot of customization options with them. So total composites, not new to the scene, but very much making integrated campers now. And then there's this new one that was released just in the last six months called Truck House Camper. It is Which like, looks so awesome. It does look awesome. But it's on a Tacoma. And yeah. I just like, I mean, let's let's just exaggerate the Tacoma's capa- payload capability and say that it's 1,500 pounds. Right. It's still like the wrong truck. Yeah. Most of those, most of those vehicles are 1,000 uh 1200 pound capability yep um looks really cool how do you say what were those what were those old toyota campers called that were four-wheel drive oh yeah those were awesome yeah Uh, there was the dolphin dolphin and then like there's a couple of super awesome um you know the modern day equivalent of that but but back then those were still hilux and there were you could buy a one ton yeah four-wheel drive that had a dually rear axle you could i i don't I don't know. I would love to see one of these truck house things because again, they look cool, but I'm just like, guys, why? I know that they've done bigger brakes and they've done like diamond axles or something, but it doesn't, I mean, I've been on the trail with a Tacoma with an XP camper with the driver that knew what they're doing. And we were just getting on it a little bit in like Monument Valley or something and it bent its frame. Yeah. So I, I don't know what the, if you have to modify a $40,000 Tacoma with aftermarket axles you know uh, i think they did long travel on the front brakes all this stuff it's it's like you could have just bought a 2500 yeah and it would have just done everything better with more payload at the end of the day and and the challenge and i remember when i worked with earth roamer on the xvjp this was a long time ago this was you know 2005 when i was working on that project with them, the most difficult thing to overcome was the recertification of the car to a higher gross vehicle weight rating. So you can do these things like add brakes and add axles and all of that, but someone who can afford a truck house camper is someone of means. Yeah. And if you get in an accident with that vehicle and it's not recertified for the higher gross vehicle weight rating and you hit a bus full of children. A lawyer is going to have we don't yeah. know the exact implications, but we know that that would maybe leave the door open. It does. It, it leaves the door open, most importantly, to the insurance company saying, you, ha- you are driving a vehicle that's overweight. Yeah. And there are many insurance companies that have clauses specific to modifications and most often related to gross vehicle weight r- rating. So if you overload your car, in this case intentionally, yeah. and you get into a really bad accident where you would want your insurance company to protect you, there's a good chance that you're not going to get protected. So truck house camper is going to have to find a way to recertify this. Or, or do it on like, if, if budget is a thing, do it on an F-150. Yeah. You can get an F-150 with, a, you know, 3,000 pound capacity. Totally. And yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to me um, that they chose to go that route. I and mean, I know that there's a lot of Tacoma people. Yeah. And it looks great. I mean, it, it looks literally amazing. looks like a mini rad earth roamer. Yeah. But it... It's such a challenge when, and that vehicle, a four-door long bed, it has about an 1,100-pound payload. It doesn't get out of its way. Yeah. I think they supercharged it too, which is yeah. another shortcoming of that platform. Like, yeah. So now you're going to void your factory warranty, although I know some of those superchargers will offer a warranty with them. Sure. It just doesn't add up to it, me. Yeah, it doesn't. Like, so, yeah. With so full acknowledgement so of the fact that it looks awesome. It looks amazing. The, yeah. the craftsmanship looks great on yeah. it. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked that, that somebody's doing that, but... It would seem to me that uh, long travel on a expedition camper is a bunch of unnecessary complexity. Yeah, unnecessary complexity. A new rear axle is unnecessary cost. A supercharger is you you know great. You've made more horsepower, but now you still have this terrible transmission. Yeah, and then you have to regear it because it's a Tacoma and they can't get out of their own way. Yeah. 
And I mean, now you're talking, well, we know what all that stuff costs. And we know that we just, we, we could have just bought a, you know, Lariat all day know, long, 3,500 Ram or something that doesn't need power. doesn't need anything. It's it has a 5,000 board. pound payload. You can yeah, stick the, the 3,500s. Yeah. You could stick the Tacoma in the bed of the, of the Ram and still, and still have and, some and, payload and left over. I guess my, my beef is, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to have the, the 2,500 for work and the, and the Gladiator, which is our show vehicle for, for max tracks and adventure imports. But the, the Ram is six inches longer in length than my Gladiator. Yeah. And that has a five foot bed. So when you take a six foot bed to coma, yeah. I, 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 I'm just curious. I bet you it's pretty close. I don't know. It's just, I, I would love to hear the argument why Tacoma. Yeah. Um, and I suspect it's because of this legendary reliability, but when you modify something so heavily, you're going to affect that legendary I, I always advise reliability. people with Toyotas, like if they're going to Baja or they're driving around the world or whatever, I'm like, the things that are going to break are the non-Toyota parts that you've installed. That's right. I All mean, day long. Like they're just, they're solid vehicles, but you know, just acknowledge so that is they're every other American pickup truck. They are now there. like they're all good. Like, they're all really good now. You know, they've all kind of figured it out. So, um, yeah, but. so that's one, this, this, uh, truck house camper. And then there's this new bond camper works that has a very earth roamer looking camper conversion on the back. We don't know much about that. It's just been released and they when we get some more awesome information rear doors on theirs and i'm just pulling their their website up um yeah they have the, the last time i saw one of their campers it was like the rear doors Ooh. opened up oh and interesting. i thought that that was so cool because you could put a dirt bike or, or, oh, or yeah, whatever yeah. in there make it a little mini toy hauler yeah. and, and the quality and the craftsmanship looks looks pretty interesting on these yeah. things um you know they're saying that they've had builds that were 100 and they've had builds you know and it's, you know, up to half a million dollars or something. So I think it's really like a custom, a custom option, um, you know, and I think that those things are pretty interesting, but then you're still, you're still building a Well, if you're somebody that wants specifically what they want. Yeah. Um, that can be, a, that can, be can definitely option, be an yeah. option for sure. So most of what we're going to talk about today is based on an article that we did in the spring 2020 issue of Overland Journal where we compared all of the currently available expedition campers at the time, or at least ones of significant volume. And we're going to talk about most of those. Um, we're not going to talk about a couple of them. but um, And then we're going to supplant a little bit of the Earth Cruiser EXP with their new Terra Nova, and we'll talk about why that's important. But I think it'd be great to talk about the Earth Roamer first, because they deserve to be talked about first only because they were pretty much the and first. And we're both super <laughs> familiar with one. I mean, you yeah. you spent a lot of time with those. I did. Um, I have an older one. Yeah. Uh, they're they're like little yachts. I don't <laughs> we call it land yachting. I mean, yeah. I don't know how to explain this thing. I mean, I I I I love mine. Um it does everything that I want. I'm not looking for I mean, it it has quite a bit of off-road capability, but I, honestly, on all of these trucks, the size and the weight precludes them from a lot of technical trails. Yeah. Um, could you make it? Yeah. Should you? When you realize that you have your house on the back. Yeah. Um, and everything that's rattling. Um, I don't know. I, I think like Earth Roamer, Earth Cruiser is kind of like the the Ford and Chevy right now in yeah, the expedition for sure. vehicle world. Definitely doing all the volume. Yeah. Um, you know, the Earth Roamer, I, I haven't seen anything in the U.S. that is as turnkey as the Earth Roamer. I mean, mine, mine's a 2011. Um, there's 10 years of small innovations that have happened since then. Um, and even mine's just, like, ready to go. Yeah. Aside from that small little hiccup that I had with the motor blowing up immediately <laughs> after I bought it. Yeah. Um, but, again, that's a Ford thing totally unrelated to the camper yeah um but i think that i think that bill swales was in a unique position where he saw overlanding as becoming a thing he had done well with some investments and he had built a camper for himself um i think it was a camper builder out of out of canada if i remember 
and he had built it on on a Dodge, and he had just and he started traveling in it. He was living out of this thing and making notes on all the things that he would do different. And then when he started Earth Roamer, here you have a businessman with a lot of engine. He was an engineer as well, yeah. or is an engineer. And he had all of this experience and he pulled it together in like, let's invest in making a great company that builds campers that a lot of people are going to want to buy. And he's just somehow found that perfect balance of desirability. I think it's two years right now. If you, if you want to hand them upwards of 700 grand, it's, yeah, it's two years and maybe a little bit shorter now, but yeah, it could be, but they've been through a lot and you know, they had some real challenges during the economic downturn with the housing crisis and everything else like that. But Bill has just done a really good job of making a sustainable company that's now been around for almost 20 years. And I just, I congratulate Bill on that. And, and I've known Bill for a very long time and I don't have any, any financial ties to earth roamer in any way, but I do just really appreciate what he's done. And I think that that's the reason why his, campers continue to be so successful and, and they're a well thought out design yeah they're a good package and more importantly like everything else that i look at i just when you've spent time in the earth roamer you look at everything else and it's second best yeah um i know that there are things that other companies specialize in maybe they're a little bit more off-road capable maybe they're better for international travel but for domestic U.S. travel, I have a Ford dealer on every corner. Yep. I may need it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but just just the layout is is so efficient. Like, uh, when I take people into mine, I, I there's a few things I always show them. The first thing I do is I go to the control panel and I show them the quality of the wiring. Yeah. And how, I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't achieve this level of perfection in a million years. Yeah. Uh, everything is perfect. Everything is loomed right. Everything is just great. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you pull that control panel down, which is like the nerve center of the vehicle. Um, and then, you know, for as far as use of space, you start to realize like, oh, well, you have this big cabinet that's like has the cedar lined hanging drawer. Well, the cabinet folds out. Well, the, the, the drawer or it's not the drawer. door, the door, yeah. it's a door. The door comes out and then the door to the bathroom comes out. And you actually double the space of your bathroom and right. all of your towels and all of your toiletries and everything are in are in that closet. And it all of a sudden doesn't feel cramped. And then they have like uh, heated air being pumped into the bathroom with its own dedicated fan. So while it is a wet bath, uh, the difference between a wet bath and a dry bath is one is a combination shower and one is a separate shower and, sure. and toilet. Um, but it dries within like 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so it's just great use of space. You have like this whole cabinet and this, this, this thing of, of actual clothing drawers. There's something to be said for decades of being in business. You just, yeah. you, you learn a lot. And when you have a vehicle where it's, they haven't had to compromise a lot because people have been willing to pay for it. Yeah. They've just really continued to evolve and make it a really high, high quality unit. And, and I remember when I, when I drove down to the Darien Gap, I was driving an Earth Roamer Jeep that I had purchased. And of course that was a very different kind of vehicle. And that vehicle was not as successful as their, as their big LT. In fact, I think they only made about 13 of those, but it was perfect for my needs, but I was a very small customer set like that wanted a really small vehicle, a highly capable camper. Um, But we had with us an, an earth roamer LT. So we had a big, and it, that vehicle went essentially everywhere that we went. We did bring along a long section of PVC pipe so that way, and we notched the end of it. We put a little notch at the end of the pipe so that way we could push up the wires and the phone lines and all that other stuff. that's a great idea. We were constantly in Central America running into weird wiring or low wires or low cables and things like that. So we we were constantly having to lift that up or even branches and things like that. But we, we drove it back into Mayan ruins. We drove it into the mud. We drove it across water crossings in Nicaragua. And I think that when you look at an earth roamer, you don't say, oh, this looks really capable. I'm going to take it four-wheeling. I don't think that that's the use case. I think the idea is I'm going to take it traveling, and every once in a while I'm going to run into a problem. Reserve I'm capacity. Gonna, exactly. So you're going to have this rever- reserve capacity. You're not going to, like, spin the barrel 
you know, every day with a three hundred thousand to seven hundred thousand dollar vehicle, you're gonna like every once in a while you got to pull the trigger on this capability, and it's probably gonna work for you. I remember driving them over Mosquito Pass, which isn't super technical, but to take an RV to the top of it, that's fairly notable. I mean, they they basically weigh twenty thousand pounds. Yeah, they do. You know, and they're, they're nine feet wide almost. So yeah, they're 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 wide. They're yeah. not as wide as they feel, mm. maybe or look. Um, yeah. I actually think it's slightly narrower than a than a dually. Oh, it could that's be. A, that's a non scientific thing that I've done, but I, I just noticed. I just noticed width. that you know the dually sticks out about a foot on each side, and the earth roamer from the from the body, the sure. cab. And this maybe sticks out about six inches on each side from the from the cab of the truck, but and that would make sense because they use a dually. Yeah, it's platform. a single single conversion with basically, you know, armored yeah. vehicle Hutchinson wheels. Yeah, um, but they are they are very capable. But it is it's important to not look at it like I want to go to the most remote places. I want to drive a lot of unknown roads. I don't think that that's the best vehicle for that. It's no, that you're no. I mean. We look at it as a, I call it a forest service road cruiser. Yeah. It has a lot of reserve capacity with, you know, like 41s are great when you put them in the concept of a full-size truck yep. or a Jeep. That's yep. a lot of tire. Um, on something that's that heavy, it's it's not it's not a lot of tire. Yeah. Um, in fact, I would argue that while those tires are great, they're equally bad. Um, I think that's the only thing you really hear about with earth roamers is you, that tire is only rated speed rated by continental to 67 mile an hour. That's right. So you do hear on the, you know, there's a website earthroamerforum.com. It's not super popular, but there's not that many of them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you, you do hear a blowouts and stuff and they're always guys doing 80, 85 in Texas. They are like not hot, designed for that. Like melt those tires. Um, they're not, I've changed one of those tires in Baja. I'm sorry. Yeah. That well, well but it was in pray. That is that is our strategy to, to, to the Earth Rummer tire. Hope and pray that yeah. you don't have to. We were, <laughs> we're we no were further. down in like Agua Verde. We were yeah. super remote and and uh, there was there's this climb out of this beautiful, like tranquil little cove. And it's narrow and the tire just kissed like one of the rocks sticking out from the It's really the, shaly, the, if I remember. Exactly. Exactly. And it and it punctured the side. And the driver didn't know it right away. And we fortunately, we got into a little bit of a flat area, but it took Cam Brenzinger from Nemo who can do like a thousand pull-ups mm, yeah. and, and me who can do, well, not a thousand pull-ups, but we're both pretty big guys. I can do one if I jump. <laughs> yeah. And it took it like we were sweating and like it was tough to get yeah. that sucker swapped out on the side of the road. Just getting it, getting it down was not such a big deal, but getting the tire back up, into that spot was tough. That was yeah. difficult. Yeah. Even with the winch and everything else. These are heavy, heavy. I mean, a couple hundred pounds. Let, let's hope I don't have that problem yeah. in Baja tomorrow. Nah, you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be fine. I think it's it's literally just it can happen, but yeah. knowing that when it does, do you have a plan to get that tire swapped out, right? I'm just so. gonna let Laura do it. <laughs> <laughs> no uh you well, know she is our, more she is a lot more fit than you are so yeah maybe she is the one the the thing with ours is i actually think ours was the first lts so the first stretch one. Oh, nice um and it was prior to them doing the swing away cases so oh, okay. we we either have to remove our rear box which is made of aluminum and is doable or my plan is to get the tire off stand on the box get the tire off and just like throw it <laughs> just let it bounce it's just gonna bounce it's yeah. gonna go where it goes if i'm on a cliff going yeah. into agroverde that may not be the idea <laughs> yeah. um hook it to the winch or something yeah yeah um you know the newer ones have electric winches they in do. this system I, I i do have like a system but i it's it's a hand crank and i have to remove the case to use it so right i don't know that's as far as i've gotten yeah but it's a challenge it's actually the tires on difficult. these things having i guess owned one for about six months and doing a lot of research on the expedition vehicle stuff, that's I think some of the advantages of the other platforms is that they don't run; they're not dependent upon a tire. I can run exactly one tire yeah. with my setup, and sure. that is it. Now that tire's pretty for, for a commercial tire is easy to get. It's Continental; yeah. they run them all over the world on armored vehicles, MRAPs, sure. everything. Um, but 
Yeah, that's that's. I think that's one of the reasons why you know the, there's the tires, there's the size, there's the weight, um, and the investment, and the investment. Like, I'm not saying that I wouldn't drive it around the world, but if I was buying a vehicle specifically to drive around the world, I wouldn't buy an Earth Roamer. Yeah, it could it could be done, but it's not the best tool for the I, job. I would so. not. I would not want to drive that yeah. vehicle in Asia. I wouldn't want to drive it in most cities. You know, uh, you know, kind of first world cities are fine because they get deliveries. They get yeah. a UPS. You know, the thing for that you can kind of learn is like, can a UPS truck deliver there? <laughs> yeah. Well, then your Earth Roamer can get there. There's yeah. there's a way. There's a truck route or something. But as you're saying, you had that little PVC stick. Yeah, it was tough. Um, whereas the Earth Cruiser, you just park in a parking a parking spot yeah you know i think yeah we should start talking about the earth cruiser because i think that is the international option although even that you know things are changing so they had they had dialed in this camper to be perfect to go around the world based upon these the isuzu yep. mitsubishi you know platforms this one's a mitsubishi fg that i drove in australia and four-wheel drive factory diesel no particulate filter, no exhaust trap, nothing. Yeah. It was just a bone stock diesel, the same one that you would find in Africa. So these cab over Mitsubishi FGs, you know, they were the solution to drive around the world because they were used around the world. They, yeah. It was People a actually use them. That's right. Exactly. So, and it was, since it was cab over, it was actually shorter than the Dodge, you know, 2500. So oh, yeah. it was this very compact package with a big camper on the back, the roof lowered so it would fit in a container, so it would fit in a 20-foot container. And, it, you know, this, when I had the chance to use it in Australia, I realized this thing is is a little bit of a suffer fest on long highway drives, but most of where I want to go in the world doesn't include, you know, four-lane yeah. divided highway drives. And if I was on a backcountry road or if I was off-road, it was awesome and super capable, 37-inch tires, lockers front and rear, low ra- you know, good low-range transfer case, if fairly light when you compare it to a lot of the other mm-hmm. expedition campers. So I, I loved that Earth Cruiser in Australia. And then I had the chance last year to drive their new EXP, which is Earth Cruiser's answer to the fact that you could no longer get the four-wheel drive or the four-wheel drive that you could get in recent years didn't have low range. And then uh, very recently, they were not able to sell the diesel model because of the fact that it didn't have all of those requirements for diesel vehicles. So the one that I drove last year was a gasoline V8 powered Dynatrack axles, hero transfer case, air lockers front and rear, like very nicely tuned suspension and this thing was like driving a little Rubicon, Jeep yeah. Rubicon camper all over Oregon. That's I, cool. We were in places that were very challenging, like deep snow, mud and ruts and rocks. And magically, this thing, it had no trouble. It was probably the only difficulty we would have run into is if we didn't fit. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it's on 37s. So like most jeeps are running around on 35s or 37s i I think they're super cool you know and and lance who runs earth cruiser i mean the guy actually travels he does like he like gnarly travel he like really travels like i'm pretty sure he's had his earth cruiser in borneo yeah where you kind of talk about bill swales as the engineer yeah um lance is the traveler to me and i think that um that's where you see the earth cruiser is first and foremost a travel vehicle it's not a luxury vehicle i mean like like I have a wine rack in my <laughs> earth roamer. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Like that's cool. But like earth roamer people like that. I mean, they do. Yeah. I don't know. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think that's the key is it's so easy to like virtue shame someone, which has become this thing now yeah. where everybody has to be like, my way is the only way. And everybody has to be like so hardcore, yeah. right? <laughs> which is and, so and silly. I, and I catch myself in that too. Or I'm so like, silly. that's not overlanding. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I need to just, yeah, let it go. I need to turn it down a little bit. Um, you know, there's there's different there's different vehicles for different people. Yeah, um, yeah. The Earth Cruisers are just so cool. Like, and the fact that you can stick me. it in a container. I don't think I could drive a delivery van. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
you know, I, I like the heated and cooled seats. Yeah. Um, because why not? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, they just, it doesn't take away from anything, but, but for your purposes, you're like, I'm going to go to Baja for a week yeah. or I'm going to drive to Colorado and, or I'm going to go up to Alaska. And for that, the earth roamer is perfect. Yeah. But if you do want to cross Borneo, you might want to take a different car. Yeah, right? that, that, that car's just going to sink in the mud. <laughs> like instantly. Um, yeah. Like instantly. I mean, like yeah. you, you can get quite a bit of contact patch out of those 41s, but. It's a heavy truck. It's heavy. I mean, you're talking, I, the, the, the gross vehicle weight of at least my earth roamer is 19,500 pounds. Sure. I have never measured it, um, but, you know, I, I probably should. But I know that they're under that. Yeah. Um, but that's heavy. That's it's a really lot heavy. of weight. And, and the Earth Cruiser is is right at about ten thousand pounds. So about half of that yeah. weight. I think it has a around a twelve thousand pound gross vehicle weight rating. But the the Earth Cruiser is much lighter and it feels much lighter, and it is the size of the delivery vans in all remote places of the world. It's yeah. the same size of the delivery trucks that are that are bringing the Fantas. Yeah. You know, it's the same vehicle. And because of that, they're really easy to take around the world. So so I guess kind of like moving on, we've talked about the, the, the two pinnacle ones. I think it would be interesting to talk about some more, some budget options. And I'm going to throw this one in there. Winnebago Revel. Yeah. Um, really similar size to the Earth Cruiser. Um, you're not talking... You know, I, I have a buddy that has an Earth Cruiser on order, Cullen, and I think he ordered his a few months ago, and he won't get it until February. Um, now the entire four wheel drive industry is melting down yeah. because of all these port delays. I, I have I have four containers of Max Trax just like out in the oceans, <laughs> loading. <laughs> um, I'll wave to them as I uh, as I sail towards Atu. Don't make so. me think about it anymore. Um, but you're seeing a lot of delays just across the industry. King shocks are 2022. Yeah. Um, you can't get 35 or 37 inch tires right now. Like right. That there's some weird things happening. So I'm not necessarily saying that that delay is, is earth cruiser, but you know, there's still, these are still three to $400,000 vehicles where a revel you can, you know, you can get a used revel for low one hundreds. Now mm-hmm. granted, I haven't looked at prices in the last month or two because Everything is crazy right now during yeah. COVID. Um, but I want to say they're 170, 150 to 170 new is what you're actually going to yep. pay for them. Um, and that's brand new vehicle. That's totally self-contained. They've made a lot of upgrades, lithium batteries. They moved the water tanks inside. Um, you know, they're, they're not very large. No, they're easy to drive. Easy Those sprinters to, are really easy to easy drive. Easy to drive. Um, you know, they're not, you know, you're more of, uh, for some reason, I guess, a lot of people don't consider vans as expedition vehicles because they're vans, but I, I don't know, care. Yeah, they can go around the world, and they do. I mean, Sprinters are sold around the world. Yeah. And Chris Cortez just bought a Storyteller, storyteller van. another great option. Yeah, and he uses his. I'm already seeing him taking great photos of yeah. of it. And, and his Instagram is 4x4 Touring, so yeah. make sure you check out. And Chris has worked with both Matt and I and – all close friends for a very long time. So it's fun to see Chris in the van that he's always wanted. And then there's the Feld vans, which another sprinter option. And there's so many sprinter transit based, based vans these days. Um, Those are great options. Um, And, you know, this is something that we had kind of talked about is the residual value and of these. And we want to be careful. This isn't financial advice. The market can change. The world can change. These are, these are luxury toys and yep. in, in an essence, right? Um, but I, I will likely not lose money on my Earth Roamer because there's such a demand for them. The Earth Cruisers are, are essentially the same way. Yep. Um, you know, it, it, it takes such a long time to get one that you have people that are willing to pay, you know, real money for them. Um, but let's maybe talk about like the Revel. Um, yeah. They seem to have, they seem to be holding their value quite well. Um, For sure. I know that, again, the RV world is very strange right now. Um, but sometimes it, if you recognize, like, I want this vehicle for a short period of time, if, you, if this is something you're going to keep, residual values don't necessarily matter. But if you're like, I want to drive to Alaska, I want to drive to Panama, I want to drive, I, I have a purpose. I think that these these vans are very attractive. Um 
people don't mind them with miles on them. And think of the time that you can spend acquiring income rather than building a vehicle. Sure. If you were to build a, a, a Ram with a four wheel camper, you know, you're talking realistically, cause you're not getting a discount on trucks right now. You're talking 60 to 80 for a truck. You're talking, you know, vehicle conversion, suspension, flat bed, 30, 50 for the camper with a year wait list. Like there's a lot of time, energy, manpower and stuff that go into building an exhibition vehicle like that, where now you can kind of just get a turnkey turnkey. And if you're just going to do us, Canada, Mexico, you can finance these things, which is awesome. I think rather yeah. than paying essentially cash for a four wheel camper and, you know, maybe finance truck or however people financially do it. Um, there are now, you know, earth cruiser, you can finance an earth cruiser, you can finance an earth roamer. Yeah. What's the depreciation? What's, which, what's which, the, what is it worth when you go to sell it yeah. versus what your, you know, your monthly payment or, or whatever that is. Um, and you may find that with an earth roamer, and this has been c- the case for many, many years, some people have sold their earth roamers for the, exactly what they paid for them or, or sometimes even a little bit of a profit. Yeah. So they drove the vehicle for however many years, enjoyed it, and actually made a little bit of money on it. Now yeah, we, we all know people that have done that. Yeah. Again, this isn't, you know, what, what do they Things say? Things can change. <laughs> uh, a, a prior performance does not indicate <laughs> yeah. future returns. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it, that is an interesting thing to kind of consider that um, buying one of these turnkey vehicles also comes with the fact that, you know, they've now built almost 300 earth roamers. Yeah. They know how to do it. Yeah. Um, whereas some of these smaller van companies or some of these, you know, oh, I'm going to have this four wheel drive shop do this and this four wheel drive shop do this and this camper company do this, you know, the left hand's not maybe not talking to the right hand. Um, and it doesn't give the resale customer a lot of confidence in the vehicle. So you'll see these custom campers where they say $300,000 invested and they get 120,000 for it. Yeah. Because it doesn't have There's that so many, resale like, value. I'm not going to call them wannabe earth roamers. It's just that earth roamer inspired vehicles that I see and that people that I've talked to and mine will end up costing significantly less. Yeah. Um, these, I guess the thing is these are all finite resources, right? Like eventually my earth roamer will get used up. You yeah. know, it's not going to be around for a hundred years. It's not going to be around for 30 years. Right. Um, I mean, maybe, I guess we still see those little Toyota things running around. Yeah. Um, but it is something to consider. Yeah. Look at the resale value of the vehicle. So you're actually only paying for the depreciation. And if these vehicles aren't really depreciating, then you may pay a lot less than you think. Yeah. So the DIY thing has this appeal of like the initial investment cost being potentially lower. But again, like you said, Matt, how much is your time worth? All of that energy put into... I know people that, couples that will take multiple dozens of people that I've interviewed over the years for Overland Journal and stuff. You know, they, they quit their jobs in June and they don't end up getting on the road until December because they've spent six months figuring this out, figuring this out. Oh, we had a problem with this. Oh, we had a yep. problem with this. And I'm like, well everybody's financial situation is different. Everybody's life is different. You know, I've sure I've been the person that lived in a land cruiser and was like, Oh, I need 50 bucks to survive this week. Yep. And now I'm, I'm in business and my time is significantly more valuable to me. Sure. Um, so depending on where, you know, you guys as, as the listeners fall on that, I think it's an important thing to consider. Yeah. Look at the entire investment, all yeah. of your time. What's the resale value going to be? And a lot of times getting a well-known, high quality turnkey solution is actually a better investment. So. Or you can be like me and make that decision and have a $30,000 engine replacement the week later. Um, yeah, that can you happen. Know, so, hey, yeah, those things ha- happen too. That can right? happen for sure. Um, global expedition vehicles are another great one. Um, you know, they have, they have the adventure truck side and then they have the GXV side. The GXV side, in my opinion, is more custom. Bespoke um, for sure. If you have specific needs and you, you know, GXVs are um, inaccessive earth roamers, in my opinion. Um, you because are, they're custom. You are yeah. limited to, you know, you can choose fit and finish on an earth roamer, but that's that's kind of what you're choosing. You're not, oh, I'd like this custom bathroom, or I'd like this washer and dryer, or I'd like this here. Um, you know, you're buying a series production vehicle where I think the really cool thing with GXV um, is 
and the sky's the limit. I think they are truthfully the closest that we get to a action mobile mm -hmm. or, um, or bliss or, or whatever, bliss yeah. or, or somebody like that in Unicast. the U S and this adventure truck thing, you know, they're, they're in the 200. So they're a little bit more affordable. They're not as luxurious as a earth roamer, but comparable in concept, I guess I would say. Yeah. Um, I, I like that they're lighter, which means you have less problems with the tires. Um, you know, you're not running right at that max load of the tire like you mm -hmm. are in the earth roamer on the rear axle. Um, they're heavily inspired by the by Gary and Monica Westcott's turtle. Well, if they actually look, yeah. make a turtle. I don't know if it's an adventure truck or if it's under the GXV brand, but it you can be. go and buy a turtle, which is really cool. So it doesn't have cab over sleeping. Uh, so it's actually very compact inside, and they build it on a single cab ram with a lot of the aev components so you end up with a much shorter overall vehicle a much more capable vehicle i like the bright and light interior i actually really like the layout of the inside and i think that for the price you're getting something extremely capable and also something that's very comfortable at the end of the day it's i think that that adventure truck on the on the single cab without the cab over sleeping it's one of my favorite visually trucks that you can get, and I think it's a, a really interesting option as well. I like the capability that comes from that. Um, the thing to know about Global Expedition vehicles is that because they do so much bespoke work, um, every vehicle is different. So yeah. you will inherently have more difficulties with the truck. If you productize something like an Earth Roamer and – they have a, a engineered wiring loom that is exactly the same from vehicle to vehicle, and it's installed the same way. You're going to have less trouble. So just know that when you, the more bespoke your solution is, there is no way around it. You will have more problems with it. There'll be more and, and reliability that's, And that's issues. not a dig at GXV. No, it's that just, the, just like it applies to every brand that does bespoke work. Yeah, yeah. Um, they do also have an adventure truck now that's built on a dual cab um, that I really like. That's God, like I hate to say just like mini earth roamer, yeah. but like it looks like an earth roamer. Yeah. I mean, they're kind of the Kleenex, right? Like yep. the, the, they were there first. So uh, they weren't there first, but you get what I'm trying to say. Um, first with any volume. Yeah. yeah. First with volume. So that does have a cab over a little yep. bit more expensive. Those are, those are really fascinating, but they're uh, again, you know, then you're getting back up there in the weight. I, I, I have are. to say that these, these adventure trucks, single cab things, single cab would never work for me. With, yeah. with the Greyhound, but um, I like it. I think it's cool. I mean, yeah. it, it's de I've definitely penciled that out a few times, mm -hmm. like that possibility for sure. And, and I like the fact that these things don't, they're, they're not as complicated as some of the other things. Like you're, you know, you're running steel suspension. You have AEV components, which are going to be flawless. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're, they're cool. Yeah. Yeah. You but, get away from some of the complexity, which I think is an advantage for sure. The well, nimble stuff, which you've driven. I, I, I've yeah, been that's around brand the, new. The XP campers, which um, was nimble. Yes. I guess. I mean, they're the same. It looks the same. They, um, or it looks very similar. So nimble purchased the intellectual property of XP camper. I don't know all of the details yeah. behind that transition, and I don't think it's necessarily important to the conversation here, but it used to be XP camper. In fact, I remember when... XP Camper wasn't even a company yet. And Mark, the guy who started it, drove into our lot here at the offices with his Dodge Ram with the very first, yeah. you know, XP Camper on it. And I remember he was trying to lift the roof and there was some problem. And he was, you know, he was just trying to get started. And it was just neat to see his enthusiasm and all of that. Um, it was it was apparent to me that there was a good idea there. And, and I, in hindsight, I now know that... It's because it was designed by this guy by the name of Steve Kasloff, who is the son of the guy who designed the first Earth Roamer. So that's a very interesting tie-in. And unfortunately, XP Camper never really acknowledged Steve's involvement properly. So, so Steve is, is a yacht designer. He's a boat designer. Gotcha. And so that's why... I didn't even know that. Yeah, that's why an XP camper looks the way that it does, especially on the inside. It looks like a shipwright. It looks like yeah. it was an interior fiberglass mold of a sailboat. And it feels that way. And the whole construction feels that way. 
So I think that Nimble has done a good job of not only acknowledging Steve's work, but taking that to the next level and also bringing in a lot of engineering that Mark never had. And so these systems are a lot better now. So my experience with the Nimble was very positive in the fact that, oh, this feels like a fully integrated truck now. Yeah, It feels like all of the systems have been well thought out. Everything's working. It's very capable. It's again in that 10 to 11,000 pound range. So you've got standard tires. It's built on an F-350. So um, it's a it's a vehicle that is also more accessible in the price range too. Lower about servicing costs with the kind of the not medium duty components. Yeah, and it find. does have it does have a lowering roof, which is another advantage. Advantage. It's kind of an interesting hybrid. So the whole back half of it is li- a lifting roof that has solid sides, <clears throat> and then right over the bed they have soft sides. So it would be interesting if they could ever find a way to do like the Alaska camper where they have these hard panels that flip down. Yeah. That would help make it much more quiet at night with wind. And if like if they could figure something like that out, I think an XP would be, you know, really, really attractive. It would be. Um, you know, and, and again, like I'm, I'm just talking about my personal experience. Like there's definitely a lot of situations we get into where the earth roamer is too big. Pretty tall. But like our Jeep is too small for be just for what we're trying to do um the jeep's great and I'm sure there's people that are like oh he just has to sleep in this fancy camper <laughs> but like you know um well but you want to spend long periods of time working from the road you want to be on your way to alaska and working and it's living hard it's hard to get two six feet six foot plus people and an 80 pound greyhound that's like the size of another six foot human when he's like stretched sure, out sure into a five foot bed it's tough it's tough like especially for long periods of time i mean my dog my dog runs my life (laughs) regular listeners will know that like that earth roamer is dax car (laughs) well we kept running into problems in mexico um and other places we travel just with street dogs yeah sure. Um, and we needed we weren't going because it was like oh well dax gonna get a fight or this dog's gonna get a fight with him and greyhounds like they don't have an undercoat yeah too much information but they don't do well in a dog fight. They don't do well in dog fights. So um, I, I, I think that, that the the nimbles are really, really cool. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to eventually getting in one of those and taking one camping. Um, it was very comfortable. It has a full, you know, wet head. Um, and how they make that work is pretty clever. It's got a, a fairly bright, open interior. It feels capable off-road. It kept surprising me. Yeah. Um, they When we did the trip, we kept intentionally putting it into harder and harder situations. And I was just waiting for the rear bumper to scrape or for some, and it never happened. And with lockers front and rear, it ended up being very, very capable. And what chassis, cause I believe with nimble, you can choose your own. You can chassis. They're building them on the seven, three. Yeah. Ford super duties. I believe right now. That's their current recommended platform is the quad cab. 7.3 liter gas Ford F350 with the factory rear locker. They Their logic behind the 7.3 gas, which has a lot of merit, is that we are still in this weird transition with ultra low sulfur diesel. Yes. And the goal of John and the, and the team at Nimble is to build a global travel vehicle. So your best option right now is actually a gas engine. 100%. Um, and... And that 7.3, it's normally aspirated, and it's designed for fleet service. So, And, and, it, and it's a brand new motor, right? Yeah, like, I think it's pretty good. I, I think it's a winner. I mean, I, I will say I have a 6.7. I had to replace a 6.7 with yeah. 19,000 miles on it. It's one of bearing. Um, there's a lot of systems on that vehicle that can fail. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had when I was put the new motor in that, I had to go through a lot of you know, new EGR valve, new this sensor, new that, new intercooler, this, and you're upgrading all these components. We now that, but I, I everything I did had a carb EO number, um, yeah. kind of become a stickler with air quality. I, I, it might not be popular, but I love breathing clean air. <laughs> yeah. um, I grew up in Southern California and it's like e- anybody that I know that's even anti EPA, they all acknowledge the fact that California is actually a lot nicer place to live now yeah. that you can take a full breath. I remember most days when I was growing up, it was some SIG alert because 
the air quality was so bad you could not go outside and play. And now they don't. That doesn't happen really anymore. Yeah, which is so great. there's there's an advantage to like taking care of Mother Nature, right? So yeah, I mean, you know, along the lines of the the, the ultra low sulfur diesel, like even Mexico's not on it. Mexico is one of the last in the you know developing developed countries to to not have already switched. I mean, anything that's near the border, you can get the ultra yeah. low sulfur diesel. But and in a lot of the bigger cities, cities yeah, what'll happen is. Once the dignitaries and the local politicians and the people of means, they want to buy their new Mercedes and their new Mercedes is ultra low sulfur, that'll drive the change. Yeah. So you're already seeing it even in Africa where mm-hmm. you go in, if you go to Johannesburg or if you, if you go into any of the big cities in those countries, you can find ultra low sulfur diesel because yeah. they want to drive the nice new cars. And so that'll drive that change, obviously. But for the moment, it's still a weird transition. So the seven three is probably the best solution for that. Yeah. And I, and I did I did really like the nimble. It felt it felt not to mis to misuse the word, but it felt nimble. It felt yeah. more. Um, if it is narrower, you're saying like you were cruising on it in like the Black Rock Desert. Oh yeah, we hit a hundred miles an hour on that thing. So which you know it was a it's what I, they do land speed testing. Yeah. I, <laughs> so. I, I recently found out from my uh, my friend's son, who used to own my Earth Roamer, that my Earth Roamer has been airborne in about seventy on that playa. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Well, now you know it can fly. Now so, I know it or, can fly. <laughs> pigs can fly. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, no, the the nimble was great, and and their their challenge is obviously getting more people aware of it and getting more on the road and continuing to refine the product in the ways that they have. I think that it's a, it's a great option for people and it's also much more affordable yeah. than I mean, a lot but, of the other ones. But out how, there. how cool is it versus where the industry was 10, 15 years ago to see these companies thriving, yeah. to see these companies innovating. Um, there's so many options out. And, and I just think once the general RV, that that's a trend that I've kind of seen as these, earth roamer-esque again i hate saying that but that's just kind yeah. of the term these earth roamer-esque um you know elkhart lake rvs like the yeah. ones that all come out of like yeah indiana you know the, the now key, they put them on a four-wheel drive yeah they, now they're putting them on a four-wheel drive and i'm wondering you know it, it, it won't take take too long i think to to start seeing that side of the market go in which yeah I, for I'm sure i'm not i'm not saying that it will result in higher quality things. Um, but you have like the Winnebago Echo, which yeah. is coming out. And that one's interesting, built on a, a dually rear axle uh, Ford Transit chassis with the 3.5 EcoBoost and a 10 speed. Yeah, uh, Laura's parents actually have one of the first one of those coming, although it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. Is it the all wheel drive one? Yeah, it's the all, well, first they bought the one that had the slide out uh, and Ron yeah. bought like the first one of those. And then they kind of like canceled it three months into his order. And they're like, oh, we can get you the smaller one. It, it's, it's, it's been interesting, right? Yeah. Like I, I think that one was launched a little prematurely. Sure. Um, but that one's cool because that's like the size of an earth roamer functionally in the, that's my basis for a lot sure. of things, right? You know, you can get them with this kind of hybrid wet dry bath. And they're going to be about 150, but that's a four season, you know, composite camper yeah. on on a van. Which arguably a van, it's kind of the way to go, because you don't have like on on my truck, I have X amount of camper, and then I have yes. an equal amount of truck in front of it. That's right. Um, and the and the semi cab over configuration of a van, where you're kind of sitting on the front tires or at least your feet are on the front tires, yeah. you do save a lot of interior space. So you end up with either a shorter vehicle overall, or you end up with a lot bigger camper on the inside of it, which is really an advantage. And I, I think maybe for those that are listening, when you look at all these new campers coming out, there should be things that you're looking for. First of all, the construction must be composite or aluminum or metal framed so that it can flex and handle high frequency vibration. It is it is just not suitable to take a wooden framed camper off-road for any distance. Um, they may tell you otherwise, but it is only because they're trying to sell you a camper. If the, the camper must be made in a way that it can endure high-frequency vibration of corrugations, <clears throat> otherwise all of that 
glued wood and fasteners and screws and nails and everything else like that, they will literally come apart. They will on just you. turn into trail trash. It'll like, just be exactly. Like how many of those pickup campers have you seen like in the middle of nowhere down some yep. corrugated road and it like fell out and then they're just like, I'm going to just keep driving. Yeah. They don't, they <laughs> don't survive. They don't, they don't endure that kind of abuse. So there is a reason why an earth roamer is made out of composite. There's a reason why earth cruiser is made out of composites. Now, the next thing that you need to look for is that on these long chassis, because these are, again, big campers, you're dealing with a lot of chassis flex. So if you, if you, and this is another mistake that a lot of these new to overland campers make, is that they kind of bolt it down rigidly to the frame in the same way that they do for an on-the-road camper. And then that will literally rip apart the camper in very short order, or it will do damage to the frame. So you want to have some variant... Yeah, exactly. They twist like this. <laughs> yeah. That's how that works. Yeah. For those watching on YouTube, you can see Matt's demonstration of twisting an Overland Journal magazine, which is scientific actually, and wonderful. <laughs> exactly. So you want to have some variation of allowable flex within the attachment points. Now, companies like Earthroamer address that with a three point system. So the frame can flex and it just rotates on that single point in the rear. There are others that use multi-point systems that have large diameter and very strong springs and cones. So that way it can come out and drop back in under the return pressure of the spring. But there must be some way to allow for chassis flex because all of these things, especially a long wheelbase truck, they all flex. So look for that when you look at a camper. If it does not have that, it is not suitable for remote overland travel. And that's the reason, again, why Matt keeps coming back to the van. The van has structural integrity because of the body. So there's a lot of advantages to the van where you don't need to do all of these complex adjustments. Yeah, and you can and you can make vans crazy too. Like um, you, you can send your Revel to Agile off-road. Yeah. Like... They do crazy stuff. They have they have they have long range tanks. They have like bumpers. They yeah. have suspension. They have like everything that you. I mean, I I just think tomorrow if I was driving the Pan Am, I'd I'd, I'd buy a Revel because it's just done and they've made like thousands of them. And yeah, like you know that now this second generation, which I think was two thousand twenty. Yeah, I think so. Very recently. Recently, with the lithium, so they they were able to add add power reduce weight, move the water inside. Yeah. Um, you know. Then there's also the Eagle Hout conversion. So you can yeah. you can buy a two-wheel drive sprinter, send it to Europe. They'll basically slap a G-Wagon up underneath it with lockers front and rear, G-Wagon <laughs> transfer case, 37-inch tall tires, um, long travel suspension. And I've driven those off-road and they're absolutely incredible. Yeah. They are so impressive, especially on the 144 wheelbase. So you, then you take delivery of your Eagle Hout converted Sprinter in Europe. You drive it around Europe for a while and then you ship it home and then you do whatever interior build out you want. Yeah. And you end up with this 37 inch tired dual lockered Sprinter. Yeah. With low range. Uh, so here's, here's, here's something that we didn't really talk about, but you know, I, I keep saying that the budget option is the Revel. Well, still one hundred and fifty. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah. What 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 are the other options? Like, I mean, I guess that's a DIY van build, or I, I will say, like, trying to DIY an expedition truck, I think is one thing, whereas DIYing a van definitely makes way more sense because you yeah. already have that the structure, and in theory, all you need to do is put a mattress in the back, but. Yeah, the DIY option is buy a pickup and then install a, a yeah. camper in the bed. That is definitely the DIY option. I mean, that's kind of, or that not the DIY, but that's the less expensive option. That's what I'm going to be doing. I, um, I guess we're going to hear it here first, but I just got an AT4 uh, GMC. Um, that is their off-road version. Um, in it looks full. great. It is a really nice looking truck. I just put AEV... Uh, true beadlock wheels on it and 35s and i've got some other modifications planned for it it's important to have full disclosure on this i am working with gmc on this project so we were uh, supported heavily in the purchasing of the truck so i just want that to be out there and very clear um, but my plan is to install a scout camper on the back 
and I'm buying this camper. I've got it on order, and uh, the goal is to install this camper that I really feel is going to be my version of yeah. an expedition camper. It's going to be very simple, lightweight, and between the truck and the camper, it'll be in that $90,000 range, including modifications. And, and, and if you think about it, what are the big things that you actually, why are you actually doing a hard side of camper? You're doing that for shelter and you're getting the same kind of shelter that I'm getting yep. in an earth roamer at they a are composite panel, you know, lower, yep. lower cost. Um, there's a lot of advantages. I know this, this segment wasn't about campers, but there, there are a lot of advantages. I mean, you know, as you can always, take them out, use it as a regular them pickup, out, use yep. them as a regular truck. As always, we, we like to advise people like spend the money on travel. Like yep. don't feel like you have to have any of this stuff because the reality is, is that you can buy a Toyota Prius and drive that to Ushuaia and stay in hostels totally. and sleep in the back. Like get out and do it first. Yeah. Don't let stuff be prohibitive to the experience. It's, it's all too easy. Like I especially, you know, during COVID, I'm kind of catching myself that, well, we're all just like kind of sitting at home, you know, like, is it right to go travel? Is it not right to go travel? I mean, like it's a, it's a crapshoot on who you ask. Um, so I'm not going to get into that, but removing yourself from the stuff yeah. and, you know, and focusing on, you know, the focusing on the travel is just what this is all about. And I think that that's the inspiration for me. I've spent so many years sleeping in the back of a Land Cruiser. Yeah. And and I love that. And it's something that I want to continue to do in my life. But the idea of me being able to build a truck and a camper that I can work out of, that I can have the view of the Grand Canyon yep. while I have while I'm connected to my Starlink and doing business during the day and working hard but then be able to, instead of doing the same hike every day that I do in Prescott, I'm doing a new hike every day and I'm experiencing new places and I'm seeing new things and I'm able to work remotely. Um, and that is, I know, a motivation for a lot of people who buy campers. They're justifying it as like, this is going to be my home and this is where I'm going to work yeah. and I'm going to make a living and now I'm connected. And, you know, the Starlink, Starlink thing is still being sorted out, but we just heard a few weeks ago that they plan to have it mobile by the end of the year, which is going to, I mean, yeah, that's going to change things. And, I just and tested it and I got 170 megabits per second download. I mean, that's, that's, you can do work, real work all day long. That's faster than our internet here. I know it's great. <laughs> it's super fast. Um, so you can do video conferencing. You can, you know, if we do a YouTube video production, I can upload it from someplace remote so th these are really significant changes that we're seeing happen, and people are like the idea of living remotely and traveling and living out of their vehicle. And, and, and it's more doable post-COVID. We, yeah. we now live in this world where companies companies essentially had to develop the infrastructure for working remote. Otherwise, yep. you couldn't work. So, um, you know, there's always been a, a stigma against working remotely. But for certain jobs, like... I. Like, why not these days? Yeah, you if know? you're a knowledge worker um, or a creative person like Matt and I are, we can work from most places. Yeah. Uh, and we certainly need to spend time with our team, and that's all going to be built into my strategy. But being able to work from this scout camper from Alaska or from the Grand Canyon, that sounds really appealing. Yeah. Well... We'll see how that all turns out, and we'll have a future podcast on sliding campers as well. We'll also talk more about my project vehicle in a future episode as well. Um, we do need to quickly talk about the Terra Nova, which is Earth Cruiser's new offering. Oh, yeah, the Terra Nova is awesome. Yeah, and that's just been released, and I know that they've got many of them on pre-order, and they've been very successful. That was a successful launch for them. So it is a pop-top Earth Cruiser on a, a one a, ton, yeah, a one ton Ford or, or or Dodge, you can put you can pick your platform. It looks great. It looks really good. It's very lightweight. It has all of that simplicity that you would expect from Earth Cruiser with a high degree of performance and build quality. So this is a composite base, and then it has a pop top roof um, with soft sides, which makes it you know a solid three season solution, uh, four season um, with some care. 
But um, these are really, really cool new campers. It's a new one on the market. Matt and I have not had a chance to test it yet. Um, but we do know Earth Cruiser well, and we know the quality of their products. And I suspect it's going to be a real winner. Um, so more details on the Terra Nova once we yeah, get a chance yeah, to try it out. Yeah, we to drive in that. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, cool. Yeah, those are all good ideas, Matt, around, you know, like, why do we, like, what's the real cost of buying these things? And it's maybe lower than we think. Yeah. And what's the real advantages of being able to sleep comfortably and live comfortably out of our vehicle while we're working and playing? Um, that's why these campers have become so popular. Yeah, and, and, and you know, kind of like we said, you can do it on all, all kinds of levels. You know, that can be a DIY van, that can be an Earth Roamer, that can be a, you know, a Unicat, which yep. we didn't really talk about because you can't really get those here. <laughs> not really. Um, yeah, not really. You know, but, yeah, as long as it gets you out and... That's what I'm all about. So, And if you've got further questions on Expedition Campers, uh, you can always reach out to Matt and myself. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at scott.a.brady. And Matt, I think, has suspended. Have you suspended yeah, your Instagram? you know, it, it's just becoming a bit toxic for me. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just not doing Instagram for a while. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm taking that, that time that we all spend. Yes. On social media, which is hours a day. Yeah. And I'm putting it into other aspects of my life and spending the rest trying to get out and travel. So Yeah, good um, for you. You know. But you're actually having those experiences instead of yeah, taking I, photos and sharing. I, I, it do, with I do I do occasionally log into Facebook and I posted something like did some really cool stuff last week, forgot to take pictures for the <laughs> internet. You <Yeah>. know. <laughs> yeah. Um but uh, I guess you can reach out, you know, through through my company, through Adventure Imports. Yep. Um, we're on Instagram. And, yeah, uh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Go, go to Adventure, at Adventure Imports on Instagram, and you yeah. can somehow find your way to, to Matt from there. Yeah, sounds good. And thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next time.